Welcome back to our series on electricity and magnetism. In this episode, we're going to continue our series on calculating the electric field from a continuous charge distribution. In this case, from a charged ring. Unlike the previous video where we found it at the center of a charged arc, we're not necessarily just interested in the electric field at the center of a ring. We'll see why in just a second, but that would actually be a really dull analysis. What we want to do instead is look at the electric field at some point along the axis of the ring. So this will be where we're locating uh, the analysis for our electric field. We want to know the electric field at this point along the axis of a ring. Let's add some dimensions so that we can talk about this ring. So the ring will have a radius of R that runs from the center out to every point on the ring. The ring is going to have a linear charge distribution, very similar to all the other ones we've been doing. The total charge Q will be spread out over the entire circumference, which will be 2 pi times R. And that, of course, will equal, that ratio will equal lambda, the linear charge distribution. Well, here's a tiny piece of that charged edge. So once again, we're going to have to determine the ratio of how much charge is in the little piece versus how much arc length that actually encompasses. We're going to integrate this as a function of theta. And theta, basically, is going to be an angle that swings around and takes into account every part of this charged ring. So once again, we're going to need an arc length in terms of theta. So what that's going to be equal to is dq. That's the tiny amount of charge in the little element. And then, of course, the length of the arc is going to be the tiny portion of the circumference. And that's going to be equal to d theta times the radius. The radius, in this case, is a constant. So it's r d theta. So that will allow us to quantify what dq is. When it's time to build the integral, our dq is going to be equal to lambda r d theta. OK, the question now is, how far is that a little element from our tiny piece uh, uh, to the location on this axis where we want to actually locate the electric field? Well, let's trace that out, too. This is going to be the true radius, not the radius of the ring, but the radius of our analysis, the denominator of Coulomb's law, that r squared. So this is going to be the radius. And of course, we're going to have to find it. Well, I'm just going to make up a dummy variable to represent this distance. We'll call it z. And that will represent the location of the point from the center of the circle. Of course, this is the radius of that circular arc of charge. So now we can solve for what the radius is. That little r is just going to be the Pythagorean theorem. Since this radius is going to be perpendicular, it's lying in the plane of the circle of charge. And of course, this line z comes out perpendicular to it since it's axial. So r squared is going to be equal to z squared plus big R squared, or the radius itself is equal to the square root of r squared plus z squared. So that takes care of the first two of our steps. We want to quantify the radius in terms of the geometry of the problem. We also want to quantify dq in terms of the distribution of charge and lambda. And now our final goal is to actually build the integral that we want to take and, and place in those limits. The limits in this case are pretty easy. We want to go around the full circle, so I know it's going to be 0 to 2 pi. There is one problem, though, and that is just like our arc problem, uh, this turns out to be multidimensional. I'm not going to be able to do a single integral and pull this off. And here's the reason why. Notice that from this location of charge, it's going to produce an electric field that follows that radius. The electric field is going to point in this direction. And this is just the tiny electric field uh, from this tiny element right here. So if we call the element E, this is going to be E sub E. Of course, as I move the element around, the direction that the E sub E points is going to change. It's actually going to form a little cone. That is, it's going to swing forward as I go along the back edge of the ring. It's going to swing up as I go along the bottom edge of the ring. And it's going to form this cone. And I really need to sum all of those electric field vectors at this location in order to get the overall electric field at that point. 
Well, this is a case where symmetry is really going to come to our rescue. The reason why is this really consists of just two components. One points straight down the axis parallel to Z, and the other one points perpendicular to it. And if we note that all of those perpendicular components are gonna swing in a full circle, of course, they're all going to cancel out. In essence, the Y component, that is the up and down component of every one of these vectors, is going to cancel out to an opposite pair on the other side of the integral. The only one I have to take into account is the one that runs right straight down the axis. In essence, it's the X axis, so I need to quantify a second angle here, and that's this angle. This won't be an angle we have to integrate over. After all, it's constant. As I swing around to encompass every single one of the elements, this angle doesn't change. It simply rotates this triangle all the way around. So I only need the components of E that match up with the X component of this vector. And of course, the X component of the vector is calculated by the cosine of the angle that delivered it. So it's gonna be the cosine of theta. So if I want just the X component of all of these E's, this guy right here, E, X, all of them, then D, E, X, is going to be equal to DE, the overall integral, times the cosine of phi. Well, the problem is, even though the cosine of phi is going to be a constant, I would much rather express it in terms of the geometry of the problem. After all, look, my radius is in terms of R and Z, my DQ is in terms of R. I'd like this to also be in terms of R and Z, and of course, that's very easy. Uh, this phi angle sitting right here and the cosine of an angle is always the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. That's z over r. And of course, r is the square root of z squared uh, uh, plus r squared. So dE is also equal to, or dEx is going to be equal to our dE. And the cosine of the angle is going to be the adjacent over the hypotenuse. It's going to be z over the square root of r squared plus z squared. Now, right now, I'm sure you're scratching your head saying, wow, this is looking so complicated. Uh, but trust me, let's go ahead and fill in all the other parts we have. Remember to calculate DE itself, not really taking the vector aspect of this into account, but just calculating KDQ over R squared. Let's look at what we've got. We've got K times DQ, which is lambda R D theta. And then that whole thing over r squared, which is just r squared plus z squared. And then that whole thing times this. So it's going to be times z over r squared plus z squared square root. And this turns out to be the DE element. That is, this is what I'm after. And by multiplying by the cosine theta here at the end, we've really made this into DEx. Okay? So this is what I need to integrate. If I do that, I'm going to get the entire component that doesn't cancel as a result of all of these vectors in a circle. So the integral of this will be the solution. Now, initially, this looks complex. But again, let's rewrite it, put in the limits of an integration, and really analyze it. So ex is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi of, well, let's rewrite this numerator. It's going to be k lambda z r d theta. K lambda z r d theta. And then the denominator is just going to be this quantity to the 3 halves. We've got it fully to the first and then to the 1 half, so that's 1 and a half or 3 halves. So the denominator is r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. Again, a pretty messy integral. Uh, I wouldn't want to take an integral like this every day until you realize that k is a constant, lambda is a constant, z is a constant, r is a constant, and this entire denominator is a constant. The only thing we're integrating here is d theta from 0 to 2 pi. So this is equal to k lambda z r all over r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. And then all I need to do here is write 2 pi because integrating from 0 to 2 pi of d theta will simply produce that. So here's our final solution. It's 2 pi k lambda z r all over r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. 
And what does it do? Well, the way I've drawn this, this is sort of the x-axis right here, so it points in the positive i-hat direction. And there is both the magnitude and the direction of the electric field at an arbitrary distance z along the axis of a charged ring, which is charged with q distributed uniformly around the edge. Okay? It's quite a mouthful, but you'll notice if we follow the rules, simply determine what is the charge on an individual element in comparison to the geometry. If we express the radius in terms of that geometry, and then we take into account any vector arithmetic that we need to do in the integral, then what we end up with is something that actually has a rather easy integral in order to perform it. Well, let's take a look at what the ramification is of this particular thing being exactly what provides the electric field. Now, when I first said we were going to do the electric field of a charged ring, you were probably thinking from the center of the ring. And of course, this will give us the electric field at the center. We knew when we did just a portion of a ring or a charged arc from the center, we always got a net field that pointed away from the center of the ring. Well, it, uh, basically, with this one, we know what we're going to get. At the very center of the ring, we're going to get electric fields that point equal and opposite from all sides of the ring, and they're going to cancel at the very center. And of course, when z becomes zero, look at what happens to this quantity. There's z in the numerator. When it's zero, this whole thing's going to cancel out. What happens as we get further and further and further away? Well, the further we go, the larger and larger z gets, so that this denominator, we can basically ignore the r value in the denominator, because in comparison to z squared, r squared will be trivial or nothing. So we'll have z to the 3 halves, which is z cubed, z over z cubed is 1 over z squared. So once again, we see that even a complex charge distribution, like a ring along its axis, and if you get far enough away from it, it looks like a point charge. It's just going to be 1 over z squared will be the function that generates it. Okay. So uh, this is the third shape that we've done. We did a line of charge. We did an arc of charge. Now we've done a ring of charge, and we've looked at it multidimensionally, so we're out in three dimensions. There's only one final shape that we're going to actually take the time to integrate, and that is a plate of charge. Uh, a plate of charge, though, will be built up from consecutive rings. So you'll actually see this applied in the next video.